Hello everyone and welcome. As you can see, I am here with Charles from HumbleMechanic.com. Uh, and we're going to be talking about five ways to prepare your car for turbocharging because Charles, what are you doing to your car? So I have a 98 GTI with a VR6 2.8 liter and we are going to be bolting up a turbocharger to it. Super pumped. Should see about 100 horsepower to the wheel increase That's pretty awesome. with the turbocharger. Yeah. So I have a question for you, Charles. We're gonna we're gonna talk about five different things uh, in order to you know get your car properly turbocharged. Right. What's probably the first thing you need if you want to turbocharge your car? So after you have your car. Okay, you got a car. The next thing you need, of course, ah, is a turbocharger. You would need a turbocharger. Yes, it is really hard to boost your car with a turbocharger if you don't have a turbocharger. And so you got this as a kit, yeah. Right, this came all as a kit. This is a Garrett T3, T4 turbocharger, which means it's a hybrid, so the compression side is different than the exhaust side. Okay, cool. And this would be quite a bit bigger than uh, most, most OEM gas small engine turbocharged cars. And how much pressure are you looking to put in your 2.8? We'll probably be running about 10 PSI of boost. So it's gonna be low boost levels. I want this to be incredibly reliable. I'm not trying to push it to the max of this or the max of the engine. That's what Volkswagen's known for. Pushing it to the max. <laughs> I was gonna say reliability. Oh. <laughs> and honesty and integrity. <laughs> Glad we got all those yes. out. Pew, you, pew, got, you got to do it like this. Pew. It's the gangster way. Well, what, about, what if I'm not that gangster? You pew, can work pew, on pew, it. Maybe pew. this one. Pew, pew. So Charles, what's next uh, on the list? So next up on the list is going to be upgrading fuel components. In most cases, the stock fuel components, meaning fuel pump in tank, high pressure pump if it has one, and fuel injectors are probably not enough to deliver the extra quantity of fuel that your engine's going to need. We're pushing more air into the cylinder and we need to back that up with fuel right. more power you need more fuel right. and the oem are probably going to have something capable for you know max power obviously and then a rich air fuel mixture if needed uh, but not much more than that so you need to be able to have more flow and right. that's what these will do for you as well as the uh, inline fuel pump now the other thing worth mentioning about fuel is if you're going to be turbocharging your car clearly you know you're putting some money into it you might as well uh, use the best fuel out there you can buy, the highest octane you can buy. And reason being is because that reduces your chance of having knock. Uh, it's just one less thing to worry about. Uh, so get good fuel in it, get a higher octane fuel so you don't have to worry so much about pre-ignition or knock occurring uh, in using those lower octane fuels, which are more, more common to have. Right, and, and some of this may be a little bit overkill for me in the amount of boost that I'm running. But I'd rather, as this build goes on, yeah. do a little bit more than I absolutely need. You know, you might be able to run on stock injector, stock fuel pump, but the last point you want to run out of fuel delivery is at the highest boost level. Right, and then you're lean, and then all of a sudden you're getting pre-ignition, and then you have bigger problems uh, way than big, just your injectors. Way bigger yeah. problems like holes and pistons. Because of pew, pew. Because of actually pew. not pew, pew. More like oh. pew. Pew. <laughs> The third thing we're gonna need when we're adding a turbocharger onto our car is proper engine management. So the ECM- And monitoring. And we need a way to monitor it. We'll talk about the monitoring <laughs> in a second. Uh, so we're gonna need to have a computer that can compensate for this increase in air and this fuel demand. Simply putting new injectors in it is not going to get it done. In fact, it'll probably in some ways make your car run worse. On an old car like mine, it is actually a chip that gets installed. So you've heard people talk about chipping their car. That one literally is a chip. If the car is more modern, usually it just comes in the form of an ECM tune. Some ECMs do need to be opened up um, to do this, like adding a ground wire is a really common thing, or simply plugging into the OBD and changing the mapping and letting the computer know that you are now going to be increasing airflow. Of course, then that needs to increase fuel, change timing perhaps. It really depends on how much boost you're going to be asking for from the turbocharger. And in certain situations, you're potentially electrically controlling boost as well. So we need to have a computer that can compensate for all that stuff. Okay, and so on the monitoring end, you're gonna be looking at exhaust gas temperatures and wideband O2 right. sensor for your right. air fuel ratio. Right, depending on how you're doing it, you know, a lot of these things a lot of these turbocharger setups come as kits. So it's gonna come with a tune or may come with a whole new engine computer. That does make it quite a bit easier, but even though the ECM is gonna be tuned for it, we still wanna keep an eye and make sure that we're not running too lean 
or our timing's not way off, or we're, we haven't developed some kind of problem like a boost leak, like a failing injector, so that we don't run the risk of doing damage to the engine. The great thing about cars that come turbocharged is all those safety measures are built in. Yep. And good kits will have those safety measures too, but monitoring exhaust gas temperature, and really, more importantly, monitoring air fuel with a wideband O2, that's the key is a wideband, um, is vital to make sure that you don't do catastrophic engine damage. Now, Charles, a tool I have found helpful over the years in explaining I didn't how stuff works <laughs> is this whiteboard. And so what I wanted to mention, uh, we're going to get the reflections out, there we go. Two of the things, basically you want to keep it safe, and in order to keep it safe, you want to start with a really rich mixture because that reduces the chance of knock. So you start rich and then you start leaning out that mixture while you're tuning it. And eventually, you know, your power is going to keep increasing and then eventually that power is going to start to drop. And once it starts to drop, you go back to where it wasn't dropping. You know, you can get peak power or you can stay a little bit safe and go left of that. Same thing with timing. So you're going to start with heavily retarded timing. That's safer. You're not going to run into knock issues or pre-ignition issues. Uh, and then you slightly advance that timing, you keep advancing it, you'll start to get to a point where you reach peak power, you don't want to get into a point where you start to get knock, but basically you, ad you advance it as much as you can based on the fuel that you have, the other parameters of your engine that allow for that, and then you can reach a peak power. Uh, two ways of tuning it, but basically if you want to be as safe as possible, you keep it really rich, you keep the timing retarded, and then you play with that in order to, you know, have a car that's more fun, uh, but still reliable. And I think it's really important to mention that this kind of tuning is usually best done on a dyno yes. to eliminate all of the other variables that would happen, and not only it's a thousand times safer, but to eliminate all that stuff that could potentially happen if you did it in, in the back street. Moving on to number four, we're gonna talk about cooling. So we've got three different things we're gonna talk about here. Right. Air, yes. uh, oil, yes. and water. Right. Ish. We'll call it coolant. Water ethylene glycol. We'll call it coolant. Coolant. G13 plus plus in this case. Uh, yeah, so we are going to be putting more air. We want to, you know, one really common thing on most factory turbocharged cars is they have a charge cooler, whether that's air to air like this one or air to water like some other ones. Uh, adding, you know, adding an intercooler or a charge cooler is not mandatory. You don't have to do it. But it's if more you're, efficient. It's way more efficient. And boy, if you're going to go to all the trouble to bolt one of these babies on, you might as well put in a little extra work and uh, cool that air coming into the engine. I would agree with you. Just don't paint it black. So when you compress air, it heats up. You don't want that heat going in your engine. You want cool air, lots of oxygen. And so you get one of these and you cool that. You bring that intake air temperature down. You make more power and you do it more efficiently. So great yeah. thing to do. One thing on this, you want to make sure you're using an appropriately sized one. You don't necessarily need one that's you know three feet tall. Right. And you also want to make sure you're not blocking too much of the radiator uh, by installing one of these because that coolant, cooling down the coolant is also vital in this right. situation. Right, right, absolutely. And, you know, as you mentioned, if you get super big with this, uh, you lose the effectiveness of it, so it's not right. necessary in the first place. And then also you're going to increase turbo lag because you're needing to fill this entire thing up with air before it gets into the engine. Right. Uh, so not the smartest thing. You want it appropriately sized. Uh, moving on to the turbocharger itself, you could have uh, liquid coolant in this. This one is just oil cooled and uh, it also, you know, allows for, uh, what does oil do? Right. So it reduces friction. <laughs> <laughs> so when it comes to cooling and lubricating the turbocharger, this one is actually just oil cooled and lubricated. There are other setups that would have coolant lines coming to and leaving the turbocharger as well. So we need to make sure we're pumping cooled oil into this turbocharger and then having a way for it to drain back into the oil pan. So typically you'll get an oil pan with a bung That's welded a onto pan. it uh, so you can have a return. You know, the feed source for the oil, it really depends on the setup. On my setup, it's going to be coming right out of the oil filter housing. And then cool. as far as coolant, it would be just the same. You would need cool coolant to it and then a way for it to drain out, you know, back to the radiator or whatever the setup uh, really best suits for for the vehicle, but you do on every single turbocharger I've ever seen have a spot for oil feed and oil return. Yeah. And so then finally, of course, you're making more power. More power means more energy, um, and more energy means more heat ultimately because internal combustion engines are not perfectly efficient. 
uh, they're like not that efficient at all. Right. It's like 30% or so. We can turbocharge um, them then. So anyways, you've got a lot of heat. Right. That heat needs to go somewhere. You may need to upgrade your radiator as a result uh, so that you can compensate with that. Uh, that could also mean getting higher flow fans. Um, and then, you know, some of these radiators, if you get into higher temperatures, if you're tracking your car, things like that, you may want to go with like all aluminum tanks uh, right. rather than just plastic end tanks. Um, yeah, as that a way really, just... it really, sorry to cut you off, it really depends on the setup for that. You know, it, for my right. setup, radiator is fine. I will be switching to two electric fans. The car from the factory had one electric fan and then one uh, auxiliary fan driven by a belt off the main fan, which is a little bit inefficient as far as it, uh, the overall efficiency of the cooling system goes. So I am going to upgrade to two electric fans, which will flow more air. But as far as do you need a radiator, do you need to upgrade fans, it really depends on the setup. Yeah, and often, you know, it depends on where you live, too. So radiators are always designed for the worst case scenario. So they're assuming you're in Phoenix, Arizona, and it's extraordinarily hot, and you're flooring it. And you're not really doing that all the time. But if you are, and if you want to, then, you know, you need to think about that and size your radiator appropriately. That is a pretty cool story. <laughs> Bro. So number five, uh, the last thing we're going to talk about, and it's a bunch of different things, but basically what you'll learn if you turbocharge your car and do nothing else is that there are probably a bunch of weak points that you weren't thinking about uh, that you should have considered uh, when turbocharging it. So, you know, some of the more obvious ones, if you add power, you need to have brakes that can handle that power. Uh, you need to have tires that can handle that power. You might want to size your exhaust appropriately because you have additional flow. You know, these are some of the more obvious ones. Clutch is another one that you probably really want to consider. Yeah, clutch as upgrade. well, so it's not slipping. Uh, but Charles here has some different spark plugs. Yeah, Why so do you have different spark plugs? So I'm actually going to be dropping a heat, one level of heat range down on spark plugs so that in that higher boost situation, we're pushing the heat away from the spark plug a little bit more efficiently. That'll lead to less heat at the spark plug and a more even combustion. So the way that you're changing that heat rating is by changing how much of that insulator is exposed. And so if you expose more of it, it has a higher heat rating, it retains more heat. If you expose less of it, it's putting more of its heat back into the cylinder rather than in the combustion chamber, or the cylinder head, I should say. Cylinder head. You know, remember that <laughs> if you're adding this stuff to your car, things like the spark plugs were not necessarily designed for that application. So you want to make sure that you're really paying attention to things like spark plugs, like our cooling, like all the stuff we talked about today to make sure that you're getting it right. And then one other thing we're going to talk about is compression ratios. So what do we have here, Charles? Right. So dropping the compression ratio is another way to play it a little bit on the safe side. With this setup, I could have easily bolted all of this up and been on my way and had a really fun time with it. But adding something like a head gasket spacer or lower compression pistons will drop the compression. And it'll really in this situation, the reason I did it is for if I ever want to upgrade the turbo, I'm not having to pull the head off and yeah. um, you know put new pistons in then or put a spacer in then. I can simply add more power with a bigger turbocharger. You might also find that you have other weak points in the engine. A really common one on the, this generation VR is connecting rod bolts. So I'm going to be upgrading bolts. I'm also going to be putting head studs instead of bolts. And then if I, so if I do have a problem, I can just pull the head off. They also have a better strength, higher strength. So they'll be less prone to failure. But basically what we're doing here is you're choosing, you know, how much risk do you want to have? You can choose to do less of these things and as a result have more risk of something going wrong or you can choose to play it very safe uh, like Charles is doing and you know putting in these extra measures to make sure that the car is more reliable right uh, so that's kind of you know that's the balance you need to make and it would be my personal suggestion uh, that you do all of them and you don't turbocharge your car and you leave it stock and you just change it at the dealership, you let them do it, and you take all responsibility out of your own hands. I, I, I definitely agree with you. It's all about risk mitigation. You know, I'm, I'm going way more deep than I really needed to, but I wanted a reliable car that built good power that I didn't have to worry every single time I put the key in to start it or every time I mashed the throttle that something was going to go kaboom. Honestly, if you kablooey. Kablooey. if you can't, if you don't have the funds to do it the right way, it's probably best that you wait until you do. You could easily buy an eBay turbo kit for $700, <laughs> bolt that baby on, and if you're looking to blow your engine up, that might be an awesome way to do it. It could be fun. Great. 
Uh, I feel like we've talked about a lot of different ways uh, that you want to improve your car, and it turns out that this is going to be kind of expensive, Charles. There's a few things that you're changing. Yeah, yeah. It's not, you know, a, a $150 air intake or a $700 tune. This is big bucks. In fact, I will have spent considerably more turbocharging this car than I did for the entire car. <laughs> I think I'm going to be doing the same with my S2000 if I ever start doing it. But By here's like the good times. news. <laughs> Charles actually works on cars rather than just pretending like he will in the future. So if you're interested in watching his VR6 turbo build, yep. uh, you should subscribe to his channel. I'll put a circle over your face. Yes, right here. Not to cover it up. Uh, no, okay. That's a little bit rude, but I don't mind. click his face. Click my face. And that's all we have for this video. Yeah. Thanks for watching, guys. Questions or comments, leave them below. Hello, everyone, and welcome. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. It gets me every time. It was so good, too. It was the it was classic. Uh, I've said it 800 times at this point, if not more.